Welcome to Balance of Forces, an independent platform that provides current affairs and business analysis. In this episode, we look at Peter DeDoy's book, um, Inside the Billionaire Circle, Stellenbosch Mafia. My name is Badang Khotokwani, and I'm joined by senior analyst, Jamie Mighty. Jamie, mm. a rather striking title, mm. uh, a rather eye-catching title, I must mm. say, the Stellenbosch Mafia. Mm. Yeah. Before we get into this book, mm. let's go through the, 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 the ABCs. What makes a good book? So I think it's always good to have a criteria and a template at a very high level to assess something. Uh -huh. And this includes books. So what makes a good book? Six things. Number one, relevance. Number two, high level of information. Number three, educational vocabulary. Number four, ease of reading. Number five, a golden thread. And number six, impact. Uh -huh. Let's unpack some of those just a little bit. Uh -huh. I think it's important for a book to be relevant to the audience and the society that is reading it. Definitely. So I think that is something that needs to be really assessed and evaluated. Number two, I think a book has to have a certain threshold of information that makes it valuable to the audience. And here we're talking about nonfiction books. And I do think that books are not just read, you know, by um, business people, university students. They're also read by high school students. And because of that, they need to have an educational value in the language in and of itself. And I think books also need to be accessible and have a flow that is easy to follow. They also need to have a golden thread. There needs to be a narrative, a big argument that is being made by the book. I mean, this is just generally what they even teach you when you're writing research essays at university, that you need to have a golden thread. But I think over and above that, like any project, whether it's a musical project, whether it's a film, a book needs to have impact. And that's some of the stuff that you need to assess about a project over time. What was the impact of the literary project? So this particular book that we're reviewing here, um, Stellenbosch Mafia, is a tw 2019 book. You know, so it's been in circulation mm -hmm. since 2019, sold 40,000 copies, which is a large number, over 40,000 by now. It's a large number in the South African literary circles. Most books are considered a bestseller mm -hmm. if they sell 5,000. Let's 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 look at before we get into the book. Mm. Um, let's look at Peter Dutoit, the author. Mm. Who's Peter Dutoit? Mm. So Peter Dutoit is a Stellenbosch insider himself. He's an old boy from Stellenbosch. He graduated from Paul Roos Gymnasium, which you'll come to find is a high school in Stellenbosch. It's their elite high school. They call it the Eton of a Stellenbosch. And then he went to the University of Stellenbosch. After that, he became a parliamentary correspondent, and then he went to work um, for various publications. His work has been seen in News 24, Fin 24, Huffington Post UK, All Africa, Time South Africa, Mail and Guardian, Business Live, Bleed, Network 24, and Knowledge uh, Byland South Africa. So he's uh, a journalist who's been published in a lot of places. Mm -hmm. He's now the News 24 assistant editor. Mm -hmm. So because of his growing up in Stellenbosch, because of his uh, proximity to the town, he was able to get some interviews with some of the big names in Stellenbosch and some of the people who have been called and labeled the Stellenbosch Mafia. So he's written this book and another book which he co-wrote, but uh, we're going to talk about this particular book. So that's who he is and that's where he fits into mm -hmm. the picture. Mm -hmm. And he was able to get interviews with Rupert, interviews with other uh, prominent people within the Remgo Empire, which is the company that Rupert um, basically runs mm -hmm. or controls. And, and that actually um, gave some insight uh, and perspective to the book that I think no one else would have been able to access. And News24 has a positive relationship with the Ruperts in general. So I think that connection allowed him to be able to get it. So he's, 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 well, he's well published. He's well published. Let's get into the book. Mm. What is this book about? What is it about? So I've already outlined how the author was able to get some insider interviews mm -hmm. that other people were not able to get, like with, with uh, Johan Rupert specifically, mm -hmm. which is one of the most important interviews that he was able to get. But he was also able to get uh, interviews with J Yanni Durand, um, who's CEO currently of Remgro, with Erdwin Herzog, and just get some insider views that other people were not mm -hmm. able to get. But this is the flow of the book. So fundamentally, the book starts off by defining this concept of the Stellenbosch 
mafia, looking at different perceptions, where does the phrase come from, when did it start coming into circulation, you know, looking at the history from 2003 up until contemporary periods of time, and looking even beyond deeper and darker periods in the South African history mm -hmm. where um, there were implications that there were some cartels mm -hmm. controlling the South African economy. Mm -hmm. Then it moves into a discussion of the, uh, the town of Stellenbosch, mm -hmm. the history of Stellenbosch, but also the history of Africana nationalism and Africana capitalism mm -hmm. and how they interplayed in Stellenbosch. It discusses the unique un role that the University of Stellenbosch played mm -hmm. in creating the theoretical framework um, for apartheid ideology and how certain key players in, in, in the history of apartheid South Africa actually came into play in Stellenbosch and the intersection between the Africana capitalism as well as the Africana nationalism. And then it goes into a discussion of Rupert the man, his relationships, his positionality in South Africa. Then it goes into a history of the Rupert family, mm -hmm. their positionality in South Africa. Then it then moves on into a discussion of Steinhoff and the Steinhoff saga and how Steinhoff collapsed and how all of that played out. So that's basically the flow of the book. Now, the book also more fundamentally or more deeply explores the idea of the Africana industrial complex and how it impacts South Africa. You know, it also does this interesting thing where it juxtaposes the old money and the new money in Stellenbosch. It looks at Rupert and his nexus and it contrasts him with Marcus Euster of Steinhoff and mm -hmm. his nexus. Mm -hmm. And then it also makes comparison between the Bruderborn, which was the secretive society of Africana nationalists, mm -hmm. as well as, you know, the current formation of um, the African industrial complex. Mm -hmm. it, it, the book makes an attempt to discuss the concept of capitalism and also like monopoly capitalism mm -hmm. and its economic impact and whether or not it's a force for good. So if you were to actually think, what is the core question the book is asking? Mm -hmm. Number one, it's asking, is there an Africana industrial complex? And number two, is the Africana industrial complex um, force for good? So what the book then tries to do is, as it outlines the main characters and the main actors, who are Rupert on one side mm -hmm. and Marcus Euster on the other side. So it's Johan Rupert and Marcus Euster on the other side. And then it tries to create this perception that there is a good set of um, you know, Africana businessmen and a bad set of mm -hmm. Africana businessmen. And so it puts Rupert in this group of the good old boys with the old money who do things properly. Mm -hmm. And then the incomers, mm -hmm. the newcomers who come in with new money and are disruptive in Stellenbosch, are having, you know, um, wine and alcohol parties at the Decameron restaurant, which is a popular outing for the elites in, uh, in, in Stellenbosch, and it tries to make this juxtaposition. The book also discusses the concept of privilege in and of itself, and it tries to examine whether or not there is this privilege and whether or not people enjoy it within the Stellenbosch network and whether or not the concept of privilege in and of itself is one that is valid. So it's a book that tries to do a lot. And then also it tries to outline the philosophy of its main characters who in this book are you know, Johan Rupert, to try to take you into his mind, mm -hmm. take you into his psyche, his mm -hmm. confidence, his views on South Africa, and, and those kind of things. So that's basically what this book is trying to do. Jamie, let's get into the title, Stellenbosch Mafia, very mm. controversial sort of title, yeah. word that's been thrown around in the political arena. Um, you talked about, you know, Johan Rupert, Marcus Huster. Mm. I see even on the title, on the on the cover page, we have mm. uh, Pristo Viesa. Yeah. Let's get into it. Is there Stenobosch Mafia? Who, 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 are, who, who are the individuals that matter in Stellenbosch? So, so there is actually a Stellenbosch industrial cartel, right? And um, let me not say cartel, let me use the word complex. There is a Stellenbosch industrial complex. Mm -hmm. It is very influential and it does exercise... Um, its power in ways that do influence the politics of South Africa as well as the economics of South Africa, especially market sentiment and currency valuations. So if you look at people like Johan Rupert, Yanni Mouton, Yanni Durand, 
and um, Yanni Mutton is PSG, Yanni Durand is um, CEO of Remco now, Dr. Edwin Herzog, who was um, the founder of MediClinic, Christo Visser, Whitey Basson, Marcus Euster, GT Ferreira, Kuz Becker of NASPAS. When you look at the impact of these individuals who are coming from one city, one town rather, and who have accessed funding which came from the Africana capitalism project of the Bruderbond. Mm -hmm. We must be very clear. These businesses emerge from one particular pool of money mm -hmm. and because of the way that they are structured, they do impact um, the economy in, in, in different ways. And I just want to outline some of those um, structures that are worth noting. So when you, when you look at it, you see that individuals are sitting on each other's boards and that becomes um, a way that influence is exerted. Individuals sitting on each other's boards becomes a way that influence is exerted. And some examples of that are as follows. Let me just find my note. Mm -hmm. the board. Okay, there we go. So, for instance, GT Ferreira, right, and Harris sit on Rupert's Rambo board, mm -hmm. but they also sit on the First Rand and Rand, Rand Mention Bank boards. Mm -hmm. So there's crossover, mm -hmm. you know, and these are individuals who are in a group with groupthink. Then you've got Capitex Stassen, who sits on the PSG board, and PSG holds, you know, stakes in Capitec. Mm -hmm. And then you've got Durand uh, from Remgro, who's sitting on the MediClinic board. And then you've got the MediClinic executive chairman, Hetzog, who serves as Rupert's deputy on the Remgro board. So you see that within the Remgro network, mm -hmm. So there's a lot of crossover mm -hmm. within the Capitec uh, and, and Stainoff network. There's a lot of crossover. So what does this impl imply or indicate? It indicates that there is a group thing. Mm -hmm. And as you read the book, you will see Rupert, um, Anton Rupert, uh, sorry, Johan Rupert pointing out that he knows Christine Lagarde, mm -hmm. who was in charge of, uh, you know, was the World Bank. Mm -hmm. He knows um, the Rockefeller family. Mm -hmm. He knows... Uh, people in the UK, mm -hmm. key financiers. Mm -hmm. He knows key financiers on Wall Street. Mm -hmm. And he outlines in the book how he would get calls from certain people to mm -hmm. ask, should we bet against the RAND? Mm -hmm. Should we short the RAND? Mm -hmm. Or should we not? And he says, he, he would say, no, don't short the RAND, etc. Mm -hmm. But all of this indicates a nexus of influence and control. And a group with a particular group think and a worldview, they are not as aware in the group that they have this sentiment and collective mm -hmm. uh, uh, thinking, mm -hmm. but there is a collective thinking that mm -hmm. comes out. And you often see market sentiments in the RAND mm -hmm. responding to particular political events. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you can extract the thought sentiments of these powerful individuals from those particular market sentiments. Because if Rupert says one thing at lunch, it is going to affect Let me understand this. Yeah. The nexus, the genesis of the nexus is the border bond, like you mm. just said. Who, who, who is the border bond that had so much power to create these gigantic companies? So, so the border bond is this secretive uh, Africana network mm -hmm. that is formed in the early 1900s, just after uh, the anglo boer War, from, from what I've been able to gather. Mm -hmm. And it's a secretive society that becomes the engine mm -hmm. for the creation of a variety of entities and institutions. Mm -hmm. What kind of entities and institutions are we talking about? We are talking about the creation of the Nationalist Party. Mm -hmm. We are talking about the use of the Paul Roos Gymnasium as a, as a foundation for educating African capitalists. We're looking at the foundation of the University of Stellenbosch mm -hmm. and the use of the University of Stellenbosch mm -hmm. to create a political and ideological and academic theoretical framework for the apartheid machinery. Mm -hmm. So even though apartheid starts as, 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 a, as a government policy in 48, if you want to measure it like that, the seed of the idea comes from the Buddha mm -hmm. and its members of this, of this secretive entity then go into a variety of entities and then become captains of industry, captains mm -hmm. of academia within the Africana society yeah. with the agenda of challenging the British and the Jewish hegemony on the economy. Mm -hmm. So there were two lanes. There was a political lane mm -hmm. and there was an economic mm -hmm. lane. So the Buddha Bond as a secret society mm -hmm. then begins to push this agenda mm -hmm. and then creates a series of events which lead to the establishment of uh, the apartheid regime. So let me just quickly reference my notes here and take people through the timeline. So 
In 1913, mm-hmm. you have the founding of the Nationalist Party. Mm-hmm. Shortly after that, you have the founding of the National Purse, the National Purse, which is, becomes NASPAS, and that is the entity that publishes the De Berger um, the publication. And this was a Africana Nationalist publication, which was designed to attack the English and the Jewish, designed to create anti-capitalist sentiment, but also to promote and advance a specific brand of radical Africana nationalism. In 1915, you have that founding of NASPAS. Also in 1915, you have a gentleman called Jan Marie who passes away and gives away uh, 100 million rands. It was actually 100,000 pounds, British pounds at the time, but uh, the book says that the valuation is 100 million rands. that money was used to establish the University of Stellenbosch and a trust was set up, the Jan Marie Trust, which still exists and has a valuation right now, or rather has in its reserves 1.2 billion, mm-hmm. right? So the Jan Marie Trust exists, listen, to advance the national interest on any terrain of the African speaking part of the population anywhere in the country, but with preference to the town and the district of Stellenbosch. Shortly thereafter, Sanlam is established. Mm -hmm. And then in 1933, uh, an entity which is known as Volkskas, which becomes uh, ABSA Mm -hmm. later on, is also funded by the Bourbon. So they're trying to get in and make sure they have certain vehicles, a media vehicle, a university, a school, uh, you know, an insurance uh, entity, and then a bank. In 1934, you know, uh, young prominent thinkers coming out of the University of Stellenbosch, one of them who was called Vivut, mm-hmm. participate in what was known as the Vox Congress mm-hmm. in Kimberley. The Vox Congress then starts advancing this idea that something needs to be done mm-hmm. to deal with the poor Africana problem because mm-hmm. Africaners felt that many of them were living uh, in low income conditions and poverty while the British and the Jewish were living in affluence mm-hmm. and even though a lot of them were working in state-owned enterprises which had been created by the way to accommodate them IBSCO as well as ESCO mm-hmm. they felt that they needed to have a bigger say in the economy so then um, much later after that uh, after the Vox Congress there is an establishment of the South African Bureau of Racial Affairs and this becomes a think tank to challenge what was the liberal, at the time it was liberal, now it's no longer liberal, South African Institute of Race Relations. So back in the days, the South African Institute of Race Relations was a progressive organization. Can you believe it? Uh, And then in 1939, there was a big event known as the Economic Congress of the People. And at this Economic Congress of the People, an agenda was put out that they would advance the economic, um, they 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 would be a collectivization of money from farm owners, and farm workers in the Africana community to use those funds to actually build an Africana business space. Mm -hmm. So all of this is being spearheaded, championed, and driven by the Bruderborn. All of this is in advancement of a radical Africana nationalist ideology, which is being dealt with on the political front by the Nationalist Party, and now on the economic front Mm -hmm. by... um, this concept of, of Africana capitalism. So at the Economic Congress yeah. of the People, that's where funds, money that was circulating within Africana homes yeah. was consolidated yes. to, 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 to amass capital. Yes. And, then now it's and an entity build. was created uh, after that. Okay. The entity was known as the Federal People's Investment or False Belegans. I'm probably saying that very mm-hmm. wrong, but I don't speak much Afrikaans. This entity becomes the entity which is used to fund and in, it becomes a, a venture capital fund mm, for that's Africana the business pulls people. The funds together. Pulls the funds together. And a gentleman known as Anton Rupert, mm-hmm. who has been heavily involved in Africana politics, heavily involved in the Buddha Bond, then gets appointed to head this federal people investment. Mm-hmm. And then he then also gives himself some funding. Mm-hmm. And then he buys, first he buys a dry cleaner mm-hmm. with uh, certain individuals, one of whom actually became uh, an apartheid, uh, prime, not prime minister, but a cabinet member mm-hmm. in the apartheid regime, one of his business partners. And all of this is in the book, you can unpack it. So he then buys Vaubrand via uh, this entity. Mm-hmm. Later on, he then buys Distel. Mm-hmm. And these two entities then become Rembrandt. Mm-hmm. So by 1948, when the apartheid regime kicks off, the Rupert Empire has been built 
off the back of funding from the, the Africana nationalist cause mm -hmm. from the Brudebon specifically. And then in 1954, he then makes uh, the massive purchase which changes uh, the, the future of, of, of Rembrandt is that he buys Rothmans of London. Mm -hmm. And how does he buy Rothmans of London? He accesses money from Sanlam and money from Voskas, mm -hmm. which was ABSA, which was what would later become ABSA. The value of the acquisition of Rothmans was £750,000. Mm -hmm. He got £700,000 from Sanlam and from Voskas. So you can see that the Rupert Empire is built on the back of pro-apartheid money. It is built on the back of segregationist ideological money. It is built on the back of financial instruments that were created by intellectuals such as Vervoet. So the Bruderbond and the Rupert entities are necessarily linked. The success and the establishment of this entity is as a result of the work of the Bruderbond, the work of the Nationalist Party networks, and the work of all of the people who were in Stellenbosch trying to make sure that they could create this economic control as well as political control of South Africa. So I want you to continue on that, mm. on, on, that on the chain of thought. What are yeah. the key lessons taken away from this book? What are the key lessons take away, taken away from the book? So the first one for me is that you must not separate business and political education. You can see that the Africana um, success story, if you want to call it that, because now there are these entities that are worth billions and billions and these entities are controlling the JSE or large on the JSE. Don't support, don't separate your business and political education. We have a situation now where people are going to do a BCOM without an understanding of the political dynamics mm. of, of, of their community. But you can see that the Africana nationalist story is one where there was a very, very clear understanding of the relationship between politics and business. and business. And the people who were participating in the politics of the Nationalist Party were participating in the economic conversation mm -hmm. and building <clears throat> economic vehicles mm -hmm. as well. So you shouldn't separate those things. That's where folks capitalism comes from. That's where the, the folks capitalism the comes from. That yeah. informs the business to the political and vice versa. Exactly. Yeah. So I think that um, indigent communities, communities that are on the economic outside, and the black community is one of those communities, they should now start actually merging their political and business thought. Don't separate these things. These things need to be done hand in hand. And it's part of the reason actually why we have politics and business. You mustn't think that these things are separate. These things are actually interconnected, and the realities of present-day South Africa are as a result of political and business business calculations made by entities such as the Buddha Bond. Mm -hmm. So, so that's lesson number one. Lesson number two is that um, the Buddha Bond itself was a very thorough and meticulous organization. Oh, if you pay attention, so very that was much. something that I took away from this. And number three, that you know Rembrandt and everything that flows from it, which is Rem Grow, Richmond, Ratenet, all of these things. They are products of the Bruder Bond capitalist project. That's a, that's a lesson and a key takeaway from this particular book, even though I don't think that's what the author was trying to write. But, you know, sometimes when you read a book, you can get more from it than the author intended because he writes from his worldview and you are living in the world that you're living in. And so sometimes you can get some lessons from it yes, that are beyond maybe what he thought he was showing. And that's the power of reading and the value of reading. One of the other things that I get from reading the book is that there's a poor reflection within the billionaire business community of one, the nature of the businesses that they built and their relationship with the apartheid machinery. Mm -hmm. A lot of these businesses that are successful now were not necessarily being funded by the apartheid regime directly, mm -hmm. but they had already been set in motion by 1948, mm -hmm. by the nationalist Africana movement, mm -hmm. by this radical movement, by the same entities mm -hmm. of the Bruder Bond. And these guys were members of the Bruder Bond, you know. Mm -hmm. So there's a poor reflection on how do we now create and remedy um, the current economic inequalities mm -hmm. that exist. And a lot of the, the, the authors will say, look, we pay taxes, we've employed people. But I mean, a lot of the participants mm -hmm. in the book, you know, the billionaires were, were consulted and the mm -hmm. millionaires, but they don't have an appreciation of how in and of itself that is not enough to create 
the economic um, access and opportunity for other marginalized groups that they actually created for themselves. But Jamie, I'll put it to you like this, mm. right? Primarily, is there a problem of Afrikaners as a group coming together and saying, look, we're on the economic periphery mm. and we've got this sort of political power. Let us concentrate our, our, our funds. Let's concentrate the power, the little power that we have in the capital and then literally create these mammoth companies. Is, is, there, is there anything wrong with Do you blame the Afrikaners? I, I think we have to look at the full context. Okay. These entities were built as part of a project to create one Africana wealth in South Africa, but also Africana power and influence. So the motive of the wood was not a you know, benevolent motive. Mm -hmm. It was a malevolent motive. Mm -hmm. It was a nefarious and malicious motive. Mm -hmm. And it was also driven on the back of the fact that they would be poor black labor to be the engine that actually creates the profit. Mm -hmm. So there was a form of exploitation that was understood. And also there is something to the political side of this project mm -hmm. because the money also funded the political project. Mm -hmm. These companies funded the apartheid regime. They funded the Nationalist Party and helped it win elections and stay in power. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, and they also funded the politicians of the Nationalist Party and helped create the world dis disparities that we see in South Africa. And furthermore, we must not forget some, if we go two steps back, mm -hmm. the money from Jan Marie came from diamonds. Mm -hmm. Whose diamonds? the diamonds that should rightfully belong to the people of Africa, uh -huh. who were excluded from diamond exploration. Uh -huh. That's number one. Number two, the, the, the farms and the wine estates and all of these entities that became shareholders in these companies that were created under the Brudabon network, those farms ought to have been equitably shared with Africans. And in fact, many would say, are the, the inheritance of Africans, that there was a land dispossession in Africa where black people were dispossessed violently of land that was theirs. So the, the seed capital is not uh, without dubious origin, if that makes any sense. So you are asking me, well, these people came together and made sandlam and they did this and they did an economic, is it fine? But that seed capital in and of itself is poison, and we must examine that and understand all of it. And then these companies grew into behemoths uh -huh. under the apartheid regime, and even more companies were formed, Grand Mentioned Bank, et cetera, et cetera. All of these companies feeding into each other, Medic Clinic, et cetera, et cetera, creating more wealth for the beneficiaries. But the seed of the money was brutal bond money. Okay. Time is not on our side. Yeah. We need to, we need yeah. to, hey, there's a lot to, need to keep it moving. Um, Peter Detroit, mm. what, what good did he do in this book? What, 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 are the, what are the key things that you could really compliment on? Yeah. This book? So what, what I like about this book is that there's a high level of information in the book. It's actually a very good book. I would recommend it if you have not studied history and you're not familiar with the economic history of the Africana nation, econ, uh, econ, uh, what is it called, uh, Vox Capitalism and all of that, this book does an excellent job. It's easy to read. It will build your knowledge base as well as your vocabulary base if you are a younger viewer who may not be familiar with certain words. Uh, I think you will get an educational experience here that is, is good. And there are many interesting anecdotes and stories that are shared in this book that I think are worth um, giving credit to the author for. Yeah. Okay. On the flip side, what are the criticism? Mm. So on the flip side, this book, I think, struggles to accomplish some of its um, objectives. So, and, and also there are some journalistic concerns that I have about okay. the book. Let's get into so, so firstly, there's a failure to challenge some versions of, of, of key figures in the book. Uh -huh. And they just report it to us as if they are just the way they are. But this guy who wrote this book is a was a political uh, reporter. He's an, a, a journalist. He should be able to fact check some of this stuff okay. better. And I don't like the fact that he didn't fact check. So for instance, Rupert will say, I had this relationship with uh, Floyd Shivambu. This is what Floyd Shivambu did for me. He was my contact. He was telling me about what was happening in Congress and all of this. And then Floyd Shivambu says, no, this guy was not. And then the journalist needs to then go and establish for us what version is true. Uh -huh. Don't just tell us both versions when you're writing a favorable book about Rupert, because uh -huh. you're making it seem as if, you know, the Rupert's version is correct just by waiting. 
That's number one. Number two, Rupert says uh, he had no contact with Ramaphosa since 2018, even though he said that he had a relationship with him in the early 90s, even though, you know, his, his funding founded the Urban League, of which Ramaphosa was a part early, early back in the days. So his organization has a long-standing relationship with Ramaphosa. He's talking about how Ramaphosa's um, people were reaching out to him to help them out in UAE with a variety of things, but then says, I haven't spoken to him since 2018. I'm on the outside. I don't know if that's something that I would believe at face value. It would definitely require more exploration and more examination, right? And then the book does some things which I don't like. It includes problematic narratives and sanitizations of Africana capitalism. And it talks about how, you know, the Africana uh, businesses just got resilient after apartheid. That's why they grew, et cetera, et cetera. And says, you know, um, you know, after apartheid, you know, the Africana businesses were now in the outside and they were in the cold. But these are businesses that enjoyed 46 years of apartheid. These are businesses that enjoyed, in addition to that, the, the, the Bruder Bond, uh, seed capital mm -hmm. and all of the influence of those networks, mm -hmm. right? So now when you're saying to us, after all of that, if you start tracking from the establishment of Sanlam, which was in 1918, right, all the way up until 1994, you can't then say to us that, ah, no, the, the, these guys are going to struggle economically mm -hmm. in the open market. In fact, they benefited from the open market because they could access international funding and they could also now remove the stigma which existed of apartheid. So it accelerated those businesses. There are problematic narrative, narratives which are put in the book um, in other people's names, but are often attempts to sanitize you know, Africana um, business entities as they exist now, which I think maybe you, you, you don't recognize you're doing as a, as, a, as a Stellenbosch old boy yourself, but it's something that I think is, is not great. I also think that the good guy, bad guy narrative is something that I must call out. The, the book put me the Marcus Euster and, and, and Rupert, Rupert narrative. Yeah. It puts Euster and Stainoff as these bad businesses with illegitimate practices and puts uh, Remgro as this good business with legitimate practices, aside from the fact that it funded apartheid, which the book does cover, aside from the fact that it comes from brood upon money. But Remgro has actually, like Rupert, as a shareholder in British American Tobacco, is not so without reproach because British American Tobacco has been doing dodgy things in Africa and there have been countless reports which have come from the BBC about this. Mm -hmm. You know, so when you then um, position um, the Rupert Empire as clean, without going further to actually say, but British American Tobacco, what have they been doing? You know, they've been spying on rivals in South Africa, they've been doing other things in, in Africa where they were bribing politicians, and there have been adverse findings against them, and they're under a lot of investigation in Britain for these practices. And even Rupert himself acknowledges that the empire that is Remgro, the empire that is Richmond, is built on the assets of British American tobacco. So now, if the owner says, the, the money that I have is because of British American tobacco, and you are aware that his business history is linked with British American tobacco, how can you then ignore the role that is played by British American tobacco in Africa, in South Africa, in Southern Africa. This company was implicated in giving a bribe to Robert Mugabe of half a million US dollars, right? They were doing some dodgy stuff in many places. They had access to police surveillance equipment to surveil their opponents. They were actually sabotaging their opponents' delivery of goods and services and basically effecting a, a monopoly in the South African market. So. If you, put, if you posit in your book that Rupert and the old money is good uh -huh. and Stainoff and the new money are bad, that is an incomplete story in and of itself because the reality is more complicated than that. Uh -huh. And an and, 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 and investigative journalist, a, a professional reporter, aware of the current affairs of the land and aware of these kind of things uh -huh. should have included this to make it more holistic because this reporting is already out there. Uh -huh. Jamie, oh um, yeah, oh yeah, before, before. So, so the other thing I wanted to add before we go on is that the author's voice also 
is often missing or veiled. It's like the other is trying to use other writers to make points that they believe in. And that obscures the voice. So, O Peter Titoit, you don't get from him the full perspective of, okay, you have spoken to these gentlemen, mm -hmm. right? You've spoken to these billionaires. You've spoken to these critical role players. You grew up in the town. What is your voice? Where is your viewpoint? But is it not better for him to be a neutral party and then put out the facts as is, instead of giving his thoughts, would it, would it, still, would it, would it still have from, from, um, you know, from an impartiality point? So, so I think that, one, this pattern of reporting that got popularized in America obscures truth because this this thing where reporters come and say, here's a vision, here's a vision, here's a vision, here's a vision, make your own mind up, is not useful when there are disputes of information and disputes of the facts, mm -hmm. right? So you need to actually, as the reporter tell us, they are disputing versions. This is what I could find, and this is what I find likely probable to be, and this is what the older generation of reporters used to do. So that's number one, just on some of the omissions, because this guy uh, will tell us stories, but he won't tell us the full story, but by the way, that's another criticism where you'll tell us that, you know, um, uh, Marcus used to bang the door on somebody, uh, a, a prominent match. guy at a rugby match yeah. in the booths, mm -hmm. but then you won't tell us who that billionaire was. Mm -hmm. So why are you telling us the story? And it's not the only story that he tells like that, mm -hmm. right? But at the voice level, the voice is is missing. And why is that something that I think is important? It's, that's what I was trained. Mm -hmm. When I was in law school, when we were writing our independent research essays, we were told, your voice is important. Mm -hmm. It is important for us to hear your thoughts as the author, to see your golden thread. Mm -hmm. And I think in this particular uh, body of work, the voice of Peter Dutoit is not pronounced. The voice of Kilomi is pronounced. The voice of, 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 of Rupert, not so pronounced, but you know, I can hear those voices, but where is your voice? Jamie, with that said, now, you, you, you keep on this on, on saying omissions, omissions, omissions. What, what omissions were left out that were critical in the book? So this book, I think, has three critical omissions. Mm -hmm. Number one, it omits the story of National Purse, mm -hmm. which is National Papers, mm -hmm. which became Naspers mm -hmm. and Kuzbeka, mm -hmm. right? Because in the book, in the discussion of the Stellenbosch Bur Mafia, the author does say Kuzbeka is considered to be part of the Stellenbosch Mafia. Mm -hmm. That's number one. Number two, Naspers is the company on the JEC with the highest valuation of all of the Stellenbosch Mafia companies. Mm -hmm. It is valued at 1.5 trillion. Mm -hmm. Naspers is also the first company that is built by the Bruderbund in this objective of creating a pro-radical Africana nationalist narrative in the Africana community. It is part of the project of capturing the state and capturing the economy of South Africa for the interests of the advancement of the Africana people, right? So, so Naspers is a part of the apartheid story. It is a part of the capture story. And it's, a, it's an asset right now that controls a lot of media houses, right? So why would you not discuss Naspers in your discussion about the Stellenbosch Mafia and the Billionaires Club? Because Kuz Becker is a big part of this. So I can only speculate why this omission um, what was what was 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 uh, made, and that could be because of the relationship between Naspers and Media Twenty Four, because News Twenty Four, where Peter Dutoit works as the assistant editor, is an asset which is owned by um, Media Twenty Four, which is owned by Naspers, which also has uh, controlling shares in Multi Choice, which controls DSTV and a variety of other platforms. By the way, one of the critical things we need to discuss, and this is the omission, is the second omission, the role that the Stellenbosch group, uh, the industrial complex has mm -hmm. in the control of the media mm -hmm. and sometimes their funding of the media because it is the, the Stellenbosch mafia which funds um, Ama Pungane, for example, you know, it, it's mentioned in the book. It's, it's them who also find other journalistic projects of, uh, uh, which are prominent in South Africa. But, you know, uh, Rupert owns Caxton. He owns ENCA, 
right? He says he's never even been to the studios of ENCA, but influence can be exercised in different ways. I don't think Jeff Bezos has necessarily been to a Washington Post meeting, but when he was found to have lied about how his phone was hacked, Washington Post didn't cover it, and it came up a lot in the media. So what I'm trying to put across to you here is that the omission of the control of these media houses through NASPERS, uh, through ENCA, through Caxton is something that has to be considered, right? Because you are trying to explore the question of what is the impact and the influence of the Africana industrial complex as personified by these particular billionaires, but you are not necessarily willing to go further and explore how their reach into media is also uh, an issue. And then there are some other issues as well where, and which are not explored, which is the a proper exploration of the philosophy and ideologies of Joanne Rupert, because there are some contradictions, right? Joanne Rupert defends his dad, but at the same time, he, he doesn't want to make concessions which are revealed in the book that his dad actually did fund um, the National Party, right? That his dad was opposed to uh, one man, one vote. That his dad actually did say in his own words in the 50s, and I, I need to find the quote because I think it's an important quote, right? And th this is what his dad said, right? He said, and he defends this, he said, Africaners need to take responsibility for the white man's mastership as opposed to the native's followership. He said this in the 50s, and he was asked about this at the TRC, uh, Joanne Rupert. So what is the omission? The omission is the full exploration of the ideology and philosophy of because of the contradictions that exist. Because on the one hand, um, Joanne Rupert says, my father fought with Vervoud, my father fought with Botha. But on the other hand, your father defended the apartheid regime internationally, as acknowledged by the book. Your father did fund the National Party, as acknowledged by the book. Your father did oppose one man, one vote. Your father did actually advance Africana ideology. Your father was a member of the Bruderbond. So there needs to be an exploration of those ideas and also an exploration of um, Joanne Rupert's relationship with Bill Portinger. But on that, whoa, somebody could say, look, this is not the purpose of this book. You can go read his personal biography to get his... No, but, but, but I'm saying here, the book is, is about and Johan Rupert, mm -hmm. and some of the contradictions in Johan Rupert's approach. There is a bi an autobiography on Anton Rupert mm -hmm. that I do think, if you're interested in, in Anton Rupert, you can read further. But what needs to be explored is the relationship between um, Rupert's positionality as the defender of his father's legacy and some of the stories that he wanted to say. Because you, your father did all of these things, but he did fight Vavud, he did fight Botha, they did have animus, although I think the one with Vavud was more a personal thing, because he took Vavud's money from the ECOP, you know, the Economic Congress of the People, because that was a Vavud project, right? So there needs to be more exploration. I don't think the book goes far enough. And I think the challenge that the book has is that it tries to tell two stories, the story of the Ruperts and the story of Stainoff. But I wanted to say something in conclusion of this omission point, which is that um, there, there isn't a dis an exploration of the relationship between um, re uh, what is it called, Rembrandt and the, the Bell Pottinger. Because from 1998 up until 2016, Rupert was the main customer from South Africa for Bill Pottinger, right? And there were several things that happened in his companies at that time, you know, Venfin then became Rembro, and then there was, you know, um, a, a move away from the tobacco so that the British American tobacco side of things is not as prominent and the Richmond side of things is prominent. And then, you know, ENCA and all of these other things happened. And then, so, so can you see that there are some similarities in what the Guptas were doing with Bill Pottinger in that they had a newspaper, they had a TV station, and they were trying to uh, position themselves in South African society. And some of the, uh, uh, moves that were made by um, Joanne Rupert himself in positioning his his family and his brand because it was a PR firm and they do PR. So there wasn't an exploration of, okay, you, you got rid of uh, Bell Pottinger because they hired your rivals who were trying to demonize you and talk about the tobacco stuff. But when herself, what did you get 
from uh, Bell Portinger. What, what, what was your PR relationship with them? What were they trying to achieve? So that's why I'm saying that that's an omission of, of, of context and content that I think should have been evident and included okay. in this. Help in us, this help us, help us fill in the blanks. Yeah. I mean, with all the, all the omissions you just talked about right now, if we were to sort of say, for the benefit of our viewers, if we were to put in annexures that would explain more context to the book, what books would you recommend? So I think some of these things uh, are not going to be closed by books, but the additional books that, uh, because they need investigation mm -hmm. and exploration, the additional books that I think need to come with this particular book are these two. Number one, The New Apartheid by Dr. Sisu Mbofu Walsh. This book is critical because it helps to counteract and explain more fully some of the problems I said existed in, in this particular book, that there was this idea that when apartheid ended, Africana capitalism just got resilient and creative, not necessarily looking at the fact that apartheid got gentrified and protected through the property rights and a lot of the inequalities that do exist in South Africa today are a product of the Africana industrial complex as well as the Nationalist Party and its policy creations which did favor this particular complex over the others. So this book very important to read. The other book that is very important to read is Land Matters by Advocate Tembera Tugaitobi, which does also look at some of the land dispossession, the socio-economic dispossession which happened, and the legislative framework which excluded black people. So, so that you can see this um, epithet holistically, because the, the, the perspective that is given um, by the Africana industrial complex is we got this money from our community, we built successful businesses, we didn't benefit from the apartheid regime, and we were not involved in that. When actually the, the very project of the Nationalist Party, the Bruder Bond, and uh, Afri uh, uh, Africana capitalism was all around, folks capitalism, sorry, was all around the same theme. It was interconnected. And so it's important to read these other books to get more context. The last book that I would recommend people read, and we're going to cover it ourselves, is Stain Off, Inside Essay's Biggest Corporate Crash by James Brent Stain. I think that um, uh, Peter Dutoy does do a, 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 a decent and okay job at um, explaining the Stain Off scandal, but because he's trying to do a lot of this juxtaposing um, Marcus Houston to the, bad guy the Rupert guy. and the do this bad guy, good guy thing, which I think is a bit disingenuous, you don't get a full analysis of the the state of saga in and of itself. And I think this book is the book that I think has done the best job in doing that and I would recommend it. So I'm not trying to give people additional reading. We are going to actually review mm -hmm. these books and Definitely. give some in in input. But I do think that you don't read the Stellenbosch Mafia and take its word as being the final word because there are gaps, there are omissions, and there are problematic narratives and ideas that are put into the book to sanitize and almost um, re restructure the history of um, the Africana industrial complex in ways that are not authentic and honest to the history. And I think maybe these are blind spots because Peter Tutoit himself is coming from the community and maybe he can't be too aggressive uh -huh. to the community that he's going to return to and a community where he works for one of the people um, who actually the company that he works for is a product of the uh, the Africana industrial complex and specifically the Bruder Bond project to take over South Africa and that's NASPAS. So m maybe that's where um, the challenges exist in the book. Okay, to complete our review, um, recommendation stars from one to five. How many stars do you give us? So, I mean, I, I don't know if I would give it stars. Um, stars are complicated, mm -hmm. but I think if the question is would I recommend this book, I would recommend this book. I would recommend that people buy this book, that they read this book, that they develop an understanding of the Africana industrial complex, the key figures in it, and think for themselves whether or not it's a force for good or not. So I would say this is, uh, put it on your bookshelf. I wouldn't rent it, I wouldn't read it, um, you know, on the side, <laughs> an exclusive book. I wouldn't just illegally download it. Buy a copy, keep it. It's a worthwhile project. I think it's well written, it's well put together, notwithstanding all of the criticisms that I've given. I think it's a decent effort. And if I were to give it a score, if you maybe you want a score, I would give it a seven out of ten. Uh, and maybe seven is yeah, seven is fine. I would okay. give it a seven. Um, I think it's a it's a decent effort. 
and it is a must read and it, so I'm not saying it's a literary work it's not Charles Dickens or you know the autobiography of Malcolm X but it is uh, I think an important project that must be um, considered by readers especially people who are interested in business and politics and the way those things intersect and understanding the South African wealth environment and how perhaps we can do some things to turn that environment around. Now, this is for our viewers, you the viewer. If you've read this book, you're going to read this book, as Jamie uh, rightly articulated, right? What debates arise from this book? I think that's the most important question that you need to engage us in the comment section. So engage us, let us know debates that arise from this book. Uh, that's all the time that we have for this um, episode. My name is Badan Kotsogwane, Senior Analyst, Jamie Mighty.